over a thousand. Okay, so (laughs) that's okay. Uh, We actually met over a thousand uh, students, family members, alumni, and student organization volunteers for a total of four cities last year. Um, Our curriculum, um, previously, student leader, you know, CISA organization have their presentation. Uh, Jennifer Campbell and myself, we provide uh, American culture presentation. She speaks, I translate uh, simultaneously because we have families. And Masume too, I also also translate for her. Top 10 concerns is my session, shorter one, just uh, my experience of, uh, you know, teaching and uh, administrative experience about top 10 concerns of international students and also alumni connection is important. We have always have an alumni panel discussion so they can be our resources for new students and families. All right. Next one. So last year, those are pictures I just, you know, this morning put a few. This is from Beijing. The middle one, Seoul, Korea. And on bottom is our Taipei Alumni Connect in the evening after pre-departure orientation with our collaboration with international business development and also alumni uh, support. We won a bronze award last year for case fee pride, um, you know, for best collaborative program. So we are very proud of that. Uh, to, it's a group effort and, uh, you know, Penn State kind of pride. Um, all right, so we, I, I love numbers, I love um, surveys. So with all the survey we gathered, I just put two right here. It's really great for us to continue this effort. For example, uh, one result is how do they find out why we have such huge attendees, you know, really good attendance. of them is really from WeChat posts from CISA. (laughs) I did email bi-weekly or weekly to invite them with our flyers and stuff, but really 33%, I guess they heard it first from CISA, then they check email, you know, or, um, you know, some email go to junk mail, they may not read it, but CISA, they, once they become a student, they join the group, right? So, so we'll continue utilize WeChat channel and with CISA. Which topics are important for you? This is last year's um, survey. You can see my top 10 concerns is pretty popular. Um, Life at Penn State is very popular too. Immigration always. And alumni look at and also student organizations. So these five sessions all seem to be um, very relevant to our group, right? So with that said, uh, for 2020, like Richard, my colleague just mentioned, we have been planning weekly last semester for a while. We were planning going to Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen. In the beginning, we were also thinking about India, but then we, you know, focus on those three cities. We have designed, starting to design flyer, t-shirts, and all the stuff. Then this whole COVID kicked in, so we decided quickly to transition to a virtual PDO. We worked uh, with our student organizations and uh, alumni chapter because Penn State has the largest alumni society, uh, alumni, you know, support in the world. And Shanghai alumni chapter has 500 some members there and Beijing too. So we immediately connect with them and we identify time and dates that's convenient for our students, both there and here, because we're not physically there anymore. So we picked the time, uh, 8 to 10.30, sat two Saturdays, uh, their time in the evening, our time in the morning. So uh, June 20th and July 20, uh, July 18th, so we had both of them already. Uh, major speakers, kind of like um, what we had before, global programs. Uh, we have two different offices, CISA student organization, PSU alumni panel discussion. And then we also follow the old uh, successful example of promotions, communication channels, and we did virtual rehearsal before that too, before June 20th and also July 18th. So, um, you know, bilingual flyers, WeChat links, weekly Chinese parent Zoom. This one was unique. I actually started only for my campus, Harrisburg campus, uh, right bef- right after we transfer, we changed to remote learning. I organized two Zooms a week for our international students, English Zoom and Chinese Zoom, because my Chinese uh, language capability. So I host Chinese Zoom my, while my colleagues doing English Zoom. From March all the way to May, we're about to say, hey, summer's here, so bye, we'll see you. Then parents start to say, can we continue this Zoom every week with you? And can we have all Penn State University Park parents include this? I say, sure. So ever since May, I've been having 
bigger po <laughs> population of Chinese parents joining me all the way to our PDO um, July. So I think right before second PDO, so we, that was my last parent Zoom with them. So that was also word of mouth. So parents already know, you know, I'm, I'll be hosting a PDO with them. An email, Facebook, outreach, uh, one-on-one -on -one sometimes with our students, and then alumni chapters, so all those uh, pieces. And then for virtual 2020 PDO, we have our hosts um, remain, you know, CISA and global programs. And we have two offices included from Penn State Global Programs. And each session we have six alumni panelists because it's virtual. We, now we have our alumni from different cities of Ch China and also a California alumni now. So before when we Beijing and Shanghai, really only Beijing and Shanghai alumni, you know. So it's great. Um, then we have CISA members. They are very actively involved. Audience, um, they are, you know, we reach out to our paid accepted students. The first for June session we have 480 maximum uh, registered pre-registered because total we have 20 uh, we have to save 20 spots for our you know global program and CISA and alumni so and then uh, for the second session we have 150 this is about the population of our paid accepted Chinese students and we encourage actually family share one zoom because just we don't have enough um, you know especially the first one all right, so um, this is typical outline for our past two virtual video, uh, PDO <laughs> A to 805. We got uh, nice greetings from our VP for global programs, Dr. Brittany. We recorded his message and then I translated to become bilingual so parents can understand. Uh, then 805 to 820, uh, we have uh, Associate Director of Global Operation Learning, Mel White, presented reputation and Penn State information for fall, the plan, you know, options. And 820 to 840, we have immigration guidelines by Associate Director of uh, Immigration Office, kind of focused. And then 840 to 910, alumni panel discussion. I facilitate this with our six uh, alumni uh, panelists. And then we have CISA student presentation, and we give them a whole hour for q a even a whole hour is not enough time just you know this year it's just so unprecedented and this is just sample slides you can take a look at i we really we are very intentional about bilingual because parents really like to be you know especially with the uncertainty they they sitting next to students this year with virtual one and this is our three stuff, I gave them Chinese names too, so parents can even remember their names. Um, and then we also have uh, recorded our, our welcome video from Vice Provost, for example, you don't, I don't have to play the whole thing, but you give your idea. So you can see the Chinese translations right there and very warm and just uh, excellent way to convey our welcome message despite the uncertainty. Oops, I tried to get this, uh, go to the next slide. I don't know what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is do here. Don't wanna play that one. Okay, it's about only five minutes, but it's just great uh, message for our students, right? And Mel White's presentation on Penn State. Um, so I gave one sample slide. Um, we really emphasize reputation because our parents and students, why they come to Penn State, it's because of this, right? Um, then this is Susan, another sample slide from immigration focused. Again, we provide bilingual slides, every single one. Um, alumni panel discussion. I led this one and you can see we are very intentional have alumni bio right here and this one's from Shaman. Uh, she's, uh, he's a professor. He used to be our, you know, doctoral student. Now he's um, just uh, won a lot of awards in China in Shaman. And this is from Beijing, Shanghai. I just give a few. This is Qingdao. We never had a Qingdao alumni join our PDO. So for the first time, just very pleased to, to have an engineer who's, you know, for higher. Um, so they are just uh, I give you an example of simple questions. This one is how your Penn State education help you uh, prepare you for your current position. Just amazing how they share, you know, no matter it is about uh, career fair or it's about networking, you know, it just 
tremendous for students, especially parents. They invest so much. They want to see, hey, envision my, my kids in a few years will be like them, right? So it's so important. And uh, we also have CSIS presentation. CSIS presentation pretty much all in Chinese. So you can see, <laughs> but you can guess what's this about, right? It's about Canvas, but they do such a nice job. Um, they have two or three speakers. Um, and very, very uh, interesting how we have to adjust for July because in June, we're not sure how many are going to go to Penn State Shanghai. But for July, before July uh, 18th, we know we have 500 students going to go to Penn State Shanghai, meaning majority of our new Chinese students going to join our Shanghai you know, campus there. So we uh, adjusted CISA immediately create a WeChat group for uh, new students joining Shanghai to connect, kind of. So, and then this is very, very helpful too, because each uh, campus have students in Shanghai. So they also have identity. For example, this is University Park, Harrisburg, Abington. So they, they can also connect, not just as a Shanghai community at Penn State, also they have identity of Harrisburg campus, University Park campus, Abington, because we are, you know, we're building this uh, network virtually, uh, not just in, you know, in Shanghai, also the whole Penn State kind of community. So all the important, websites there. So this is our marketing example. You can see, um, you know, not just our flyers to WeChat, we also Penn State Global Program help us to promote this. And WeChat, um, here's an example how our CISA are doing such a nice job. Whenever we have great uh, program, they would help us to, I probably hard to see on the website. Can you see the website or not really? No, that's okay. So um, yeah. Let's just go back to the, uh, okay, so future PDO, uh, we are thinking about with the success of virtual PDO, we're thinking about next year, maybe doing hybrid. We may have still have residential PDO in major cities, but as far as we know, we have 12 cities represented. CISA usually go to 12 cities, 10 or 12. So maybe major three cities, but the rest we can join them virtually, right? So they will be residential with virtual and virtual alumni connection, such a beautiful one this year. It's just, you know, we may invite them to join even our residential. We may have them join virtually from other cities. Um, virtual PDO for other cities, online presence is something I really want to work on. We want to improve our registration, collaboration and expansion of other, you know, country and cities too. So that's my contact information. Um, that hopefully I still have a couple minutes for questions. Thank There's you. a question for you, Anna. Thank you. Uh, what software did you use for that video with the subtitle? Video? You mean for Dr. Brittany's uh, mm -hmm. video? Uh, we just use. Okay. Yes. First, I just record the video. Then we upload to a um, Chinese uh, link. Um, there's a Billy Billy video. I actually CISA helped me to upload that one. So we, we upload in a, you know, channel that in China they can easily play too. So I think it's a Billy Billy, yeah. If I remember the name right. But uh, yes, we use, we definitely utilize your CISA, your student organization uh, leaders because they are there, they know uh, all alumni, you know, so. Any other questions? Uh, that's the only one that I saw came through chat. Yeah. Morgan's question. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have Anna will be in a small breakout session too. So now we're going to transition to, I think, the Ohio State University. <laughs> yes. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so we're going to talk about our pre-departure orientation, what we learned, um, what went well, some of the things that I think we would change potentially in the future, uh, but there were definitely some positives that came out of doing our virtual pre-departure orientation. So we started pre-departure orientation um, back in 2013, but why we did that? Uh, we wanted an opportunity for students and their families in particular to engage with other students and Ohio State faculty and staff that were able to attend. Uh, we felt this outreach piece was a really big um, opportunity for us because we know that a lot of families would not have the opportunity to come to Columbus either before their student uh, arrives or even at commencement. So we wanted to make sure that we were making that effort um, to show that we really valued our students and we were there to support them. 
Um, we wanted to talk about different topics. So we actually do a full long presentation, full day long presentation. Um, we talked about what are academic expectations in the United States, um, issues of cultural adjustment, how to make friends was a big one, um, how to be involved on campus, because that's not necessarily a concept that resonates around the world. And so what are the Ohio State expectations for being involved? Um, at that time, safety was a really large concern for students and their families. Um, coming to the United States, sending your child half a world away and having, having the faith that they are going to be okay and what does it mean to be safe in a city that is not your home city. Um, certainly with the news media, we know, we know the images of the United States that go around the world. Um, so this was one that we, we put a lot of effort into campus safety and what, what was really there to support students. Of course, immigration, as we talked about earlier, that one never goes un, untalked about. Um, and then what was it going to be like to live on campus and what were the residence halls like and would their baby be eating more than hamburgers and french fries and pizza? Yes. Um, so we went through what are the on campus options, off campus options, things like that. So families did feel um, that their student would have, you know, food to eat and really meet the, that Maslow's hierarchy um, while they were on campus. So for our in-person pre-departure orientation that started back in 2013, we've done a couple models since then. We went from a day long to a day and a half because we knew there was so much information we wanted to share. Uh, but we have uh, settled on a day long model when we were doing in-person up until last year. Um, this is in partnership with our China Gateway office. We do not have a physical campus on anywhere in the world. We actually have three uh, gateway offices that we work with. Um, our director, Phoebe Yu, um, she's been instrumental in this program, uh, helping us plan and do the logistics on the ground, uh, negotiating with hotels, getting everything arranged, and certain, certainly with printing and things like that. So those challenges for us were really handled abroad. Um, we did have an on-campus planning committee. Um, they are not necessarily the travel team. So some of us will overlap but we wanted to make sure that this partnership was with our China Gateway Office, our Office of Student Life, Academic Affairs, which is where we are housed, and then also our admissions team, which has gone in a couple different names. Um, now it's the Office of Student Academic Services. Um, and so we were doing what we have settled on are four day long sessions. When we first started in our first year, we were going to Beijing, Shanghai, and also Guangzhou. Uh, we have since landed on two cities and we run those programs twice in each city. So we go with a Friday, Sunday. Um, we felt that that gave us a lot of um, families that would be able to attend, whether it was on a weekend or a day that was leading up to the weekend. Um, at one point we did try a midweek and our numbers just weren't high enough to justify doing a Wednesday day program. Um, it was also difficult on the staff when we were running Saturday and Sunday programs. Um, to go full days, both days, and then that night um, we have on the Sunday or on the Saturday evening, we run an alumni event that's welcome to attendees from both the Friday and Sunday session. So when we were running the Saturday and Sunday programs, um, it was, it was just, they were very long days. Uh, so we decided to go with a Friday, Sunday, and that has seemed to work out for us. And it's usually we're opening registration uh, usually about 8 a.m. and we wrap up around 5 to 6 by the time questions and surveys are completed. Um, each session is day long. Uh, for us, we actually divide into a, a day long parent session in one room and a session in the other. Uh, although some of the topics are of mutual concern, we deliver them differently. So depending on the audience, the parent room is completely in Chinese. Um, and for those of us who don't speak in Chinese, we actually have student translators. So we've worked with our student organizations. There's a number of stu Chinese student organizations on campus that we've also worked with to um, have 20 to 25 student volunteers in each session. Um, and so they are doing, they are doing the student engagement piece because in the student room, um, it is all English. And that's not to punish students, but that's to help start to train their ear to learn English from a, not, from a native English speaker in terms and phrases and speed that they wouldn't necessarily be used to in the classroom when you're learning another language. Um, 
So those are completely in English and those are a lot more dynamic in their engagement. Um, there are a lot more icebreakers. There's a lot more time for conversation. Uh, we do set the expectation that even their conversations with one another is going to feel awkward, um, that they are going to, it's gonna be weird talking to each other in English when you both have a native language. Um, and so for that, we do have the constant reminders throughout. Uh, we have our student volunteers trained that if they are starting to hear that students are talking in Chinese with each other, and again, we're not doing it to, part, to punish students, but we do want them to start practicing now. Um, because when they get to the classroom or when they're in advising, we need them to be ready. Um, so this is the you know, crash course, if you will, for them whenever they're coming to campus. Um, we do provide a morning break, a lunch, and an afternoon break. We try to stagger the breaks between the students and the families uh, so they are not going out at the same time because the tendency is for the parents to go over and be like, so what you guys talk about, tell me more. And then they aren't going back to their room and the students aren't having the opportunity to meet one another. Um, so that is one of the things that we have done. Uh, the booklet that we provide is in English and in Chinese. Um, so the first half of the booklet, it's a hard copy that we've passed out is completely in English and then the, the back half is the same content but translated in Chinese. Uh, and that really is to allow students the opportunity to practice the English portion um, so they can even flip back and forth. So they're also learning in that way. Um, but it does give the parents the opportunity to read that information on their own. Uh, we have passed out t-shirts and other giveaways. So we have lots of prizes that we pack our suitcases with. Um, and so usually half of our suitcases are giveaways and fun things for students to while we're participating in the, in the actual student room. This year, uh, we did a virtual pre-departure orientation, still in partnership with our China Gateway office, but we couldn't really have that full day long program that we traditionally would have. So we didn't have to abbreviate our content. Uh, we still did, um, a parent session and a student session, same with language, um, but they were abbreviated to about an hour. So it, it was difficult on what information was going to be the most necessary in that moment. Um, and we did still cover things like getting involved. And in the parent session, it was how to support your student as a first year college student. Um, and then of course we had time for questions and answers. Um, and of course, this time around, many of them were immigration focused. So um, what are the uncertainties that leading up to fall? So that was um, a big concern for parents and still safety, health, things like that. Some of the things that we learned along the way. Um, obviously, it is far more difficult to have opportunities for engagement with students. Um, without us doing separate breakout rooms with students and, and really being able to engage that way, that connection point really isn't there. And that was one of the main drivers for why we were doing this program in the first place. Because when students get to campus, our orientation is not set up the way that domestic student orientation is, where there is more time for interactions and things like that. So we wanted to build that initially into the program. So this time around, it was a little bit more difficult to have that engagement. Um, the, com the content is just, it's not as comprehensive as it was in person. It can't be. No one wants to sit an entire day on, in, a, in a chair watching a Zoom presentation. Um, so that's why we did have to limit it. And that was unfortunate. And I think for us, it was difficult to determine what would be the most important in that one hour. And how are we going to um, bolster our other communication with students and some of the information that we would need? But one of the positives that came out of this is the interaction with our other gateway offices. And though we didn't do a full-on pre-departure orientation in the same way that we did for China, it did allow us the opportunity to have to host other info sessions. Uh, with our Brazil and India gateway offices. And that is something that I think long-term we could do if we're not able to travel, um, is that we'll be able to host more country-specific sessions, even beyond Brazil and India. Other things we learned, uh, big one this year, the budget. Um, as you all know, it is expensive to travel, especially taking an entire travel team with you. Uh, renting a facility, providing two snacks and refreshments and a meal, 
uh, it does become quite costly. So this year for cost savings, um, we, doing it by Zoom was, was the low cost option for us. Um, so that definitely saved money for other things. Um, it allowed us to think creatively. And I think long term, we're going to be able to have more programs and sessions for students leading up to the start of school. But then also, how do we engage with alumni? How do we do that throughout the school year? So that is something I think that Zoom has pushed us to do more online opportunities for students, faculty, staff, and alumni. So I think that is something that will continue even beyond COVID-19. Um, I think one of the things that we have to think a little bit more about is how are we going to engage our student volunteers? And that was something that um, we haven't really been able to do in a virtual setting um, within that one hour time constraint. So I think that was also something that we would, if we're going to continue this, that I think we would have to think a little bit more creatively about. Um, the video challenges. We would typically show videos while we're in China uh, for students, and we do still have those videos, but with a live stream and with some of the connectivity issues, we weren't getting a very, when we were doing test runs, we weren't getting a very smooth run of those videos where there was a lot of um, interruptions and things like that. Um, and also, where would those be housed? We can't do them on YouTube, so we would have to get a separate channel. Um, uh, our pre-arrival email content, we really had to look at. Uh, we, we've always sent out weekly emails to our international student population from about April leading up to the start of school. Uh, so we really had to bump up that information and what we were going to put in those emails to make sure that we were able to um, have as much information in there as possible, but still be very visually appealing. Um, and then, of course, um, what's the impact? Um, to the on-campus orientation. So we had to change things a little bit. Um, even with our on-campus orientation, even though we are coming back for fall, um, our on-campus orientation is not in person. It is not going to be in a physical location. So all of that is now transitioned to Carmen, which is our um, classroom platform that we use. So all of our students are enrolled. It just went live on Monday. And so all the modules are handled there. So we also had to add more information and we also kept our videos in that platform as well for all students. Now, of course, we want all of our students to stay connected. And so we do have a gateway, a China gateway office that has a WeChat account. Our office does not specifically as far as our global engagement team that runs orientation, but we do have our uh, global engagement newsletter, which is sent out weekly uh, in addition to the new student newsletter. Uh, we have our Facebook as well. Uh, we are still interacting with students on WeChat, uh, specific to China. And then, of course, our other Office of International Affairs uh, social media accounts that we do um, through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, things like that. So um, I am at four, almost 14 minutes, 15 seconds, so right under the wire. Um, and so I guess we will probably hold all questions until the end. Um. I don't know, Nick, do you want Gabby to say anything about what she chatted? I was not watching the clock, I'll be honest. So okay. uh, if in the interest of time, we could, we might move on then, but uh, maybe Gabby, give us a quick description in the chat or something, if that works for everybody. Thanks for pointing that out, Gabby. And I'll start sharing my screen for Illinois. And uh, we'll just uh, start off with the usual. Can everybody see these three lovely people? All right, get some, get some thumbs up. All right, great. So um, we are Marta, Nick, and Florence from the University of Illinois, part of a team of uh, about a dozen people that put on a pre-departure orientation over four sessions um, in the end of June and early July. And we'll share uh, about first kind of what did we do uh, in the past? What are we coming from? Our plan prior to COVID-19 was similar to previous years. In-person orientations in China and India uh, with an emphasis on our largest populations. Those are our two largest now with Korea slipping under a thousand on our campus, Korean enrollment under a thousand on our campus for the first time in 10 years. So uh, no, almost 20 years actually. 
And so uh, we did presentations live in those places with people from those different departments around campus on immigration, of course, our ISSS office, as well as arrival to campus and orientation activities, university housing, billing and finances, the student health center and student insurance, as well as campus safety slash police. We did breakout sessions on academics, specifically for graduate and undergraduate with representatives from our grad college and one of our large um, academic undergrad colleges. And then we did a session in uh, for parents and in China that was done in, in Chinese. And so it was in Korea, we did some translation as well. So we had student association presentations in the past and certainly we had that plan, CSSA and uh, Indian Graduate Student Association were going to help us out with those. And the great thing, people have said it before, lunch and networking activities throughout the day. This was a, a day long program. We got to actually engage in a lot of one on one. Uh, one, one parent told me in 2016, I was hoping for more of this this year. They said, I feel so much more comfortable sending my student overseas now that I've met you and I know who they're going to be with. Like, oh, so heartwarming. Um, so then, of course, things happened and we had to make a switch in how we were doing it. Yeah, so virtual pre-arrival orientations. Um, we're going to look at this sort of two ways from the student perspective, what they were experiencing, and then sort of what it looked like on the back end for us. So we used Zoom um, to host these uh, orientations. We picked four uh, time zones that where we have a large collection of international students. And then, so we had, you know, a different, um, session on a different day. They were all live. Um, the start times because of the different time zones range from, you know, 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. And as you can probably imagine with a total runtime of about two and a half hours, we were either up early and work going straight into the work day or staying up late. Um, we had live presentations, again, covering the same topics that Nick mentioned in the in-person orientation. Um, we did choose um, to cut out the parent presentation. We recognize that since students are home, they're probably with their parents in the room. And based on the questions we got, we definitely had some parents in the room. Um, we also typically do have a student organization, as, as you know, Nick mentioned, and we, um, they were already doing their own orientations this year, so we uh, didn't include them this time around. Um, but we do work with them and appreciate their efforts. We had two breakout sessions, one for graduate students and undergraduate students. So we would you know, shuffle them into different Zoom rooms. And then we had two Q&A sessions. We did one after the first block of presentations and then one actually in the breakout rooms with those presenters. And on the next slide, we have an overview of our schedule um, with the run time. So you can sort of get an idea of how we spent our time. Um, and so if you want to take a look at that later. So let's talk about the back end, which is where all of the fun and activity is taking place. So we have one tech manager. Um, that person was actually me. Um, so what I was responsible for is, um, you know, the organization of the Zoom rooms, uh, letting people in and out of the rooms, muting them if, if they started talking, actually moving the presentation slides for our presenters. We tried to work with Zoom's remote control option, but it wasn't um, super user friendly. Um, we had, I also moved folks into the breakout rooms and helped keep time. And then Nick was our MC. It was great to be an MC without the duty of managing chat and other things. Um, I was introducing the next presenter and kind of uh, making sure that Marta had time to say in the background, hey, get ready, you're up next. I also kind of filled some space when people forgot to unmute themselves or when we had a long time with one breakout session, uh, we had a large group one day that had not registered with the same email they joined with. So that was exciting, got to fill a little extra time. I was also, um, during presentations, adding some links to appropriate websites uh, as we were going. So staying engaged and keeping the flow throughout. Excellent. So um, I would argue that the chat management was one of the crucial or the most crucial um, aspect of this experience. Um, students have, parents have, everyone has lots of questions. Links are also dropping in at the same time and people are also making comments. So in order to 
um, make sure that we were um, clear on, on what was a question, what was a concern. We created a doc, a Google Doc document um, where myself, and I absolutely recommend that you have someone with you who's also able to double check on the Zoom chat when you're also on the Google Doc, making sure that you're documenting questions. We organized the Google Doc based on the itinerary or the schedule of the actual orientation in itself to keep the chat management as clear and organized as possible. From there, I was able to then organize on the back end side which questions we wanted to answer, which questions we knew that we had no answers for, so to highlight at the end, and then organize questions that were kind of miscellaneous that we wanted to shift to the next question. It was also important for us to keep track of who was asking questions so that in case we did not um, or we were not able to get to those questions due to time constraints, we can follow up with the individual by copying and pasting their information. Um, we also kept track of who answered responses and what that response was because of the changing um, atmosphere constantly so that we can continue to follow up. Additionally, Skype for Business um, was used to chat with presenters, the MC tech manager, for things that again were happening on the back end, which was again very crucial. We decided um, to first keep that um, um, communication separate because as we know in Zoom chat, we can accidentally send um, information for everyone to see. We may have concerns. So we were pretty strict about ensuring that that level of communication between our stakeholders, concerns that we had or questions that we knew we were uncomfortable with to keep at the end. We utilize Skype for Business to host and hold um, those conversations as well. Um, as I mentioned, adding the student contact information to Google Docs was so important because as, as Anna mentioned earlier, there's never enough time for questions. So um, we wanted to ensure that we had an opportunity to follow up with students' concerns. Um, and in order for us to keep track of that, we had that on the Google Doc. From there, we were able to follow up with our presenters or stakeholders who were part of our presentation um, because they registered to use that information to follow up with them directly on any unanswered questions or questions that they could have answered but wanted to provide more clarity. Um, so Marta, can you talk about some of the emails um, on the follow-up end? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so after the or the last orientation on July 1st, we sent um, an immediate email to all students saying, thank you for attending. Please fill out this feedback form, um, along with the virtual folder link, which include copies of our presentations and some other miscellaneous um, useful information for new students. Um, that's a great question, Kelly, and I can actually answer that in just a minute. Um, and so then about two weeks after we hosted the orientations, we sent recordings and another follow-up to say, hey, please fill out the feedback form. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the feedback on the next slide. But um, to answer your question, Kelly, since Florence just referenced it, so Florence and our other chat management colleagues would copy the name from that they were using and we would go back into the registration form and just manually go through and get those student um, emails from the registration information. Um, I would say that I might not recommend that as the, the person who did it, it, it really is overwhelming because you have a lot of students asking, as Nick said, great questions. Um, so, but it was really useful because as Florence mentioned, that personal follow-up that our presenters were able to do with the students, I think really it was something that they were very happy to have and something they referenced in the feedback. So it's one of those things where it's a lot of work, but I think it's worth it. Um, so student feedback. We had about 100 students respond out of 400, which felt like a really great response. We had a lot of graduate students attend our orientations, and I just thought that was interesting because typically, you know, in our in-person pre-arrival orientations, we don't have as many graduate students. Our most popular sessions were immigration, billing, um, health information, unsurprisingly, uh, campus safety, and then students understandably wanted a lot of time for that Q&A. Um, students told us that next time we do this, they wanted to see more detailed graduate department information. Um, this is always a challenging area for us because so much of what happens if you're a graduate student happens in your department. Um, and so a lot of the answers to questions are, well, please talk to your department. So something to think about how we can improve upon. 
um, more time for Q&A and potentially small breakout rooms where students could get to know each other. I think it's really cool to hear about some of the, the ways that our colleagues on other campuses have incorporated that personal aspect because I think it's something we could improve on. Um, and more details about what does it mean to learn in a hybrid or mostly online model. Um, and then some ideas we're definitely going to implement next year are we're going to pre-record our presentations just to help tighten them up um, and make sure that we can leave more time for questions. And then a bunch of small logistical details that we're happy to answer questions about. And we have a, a report that we've done and we can share that with you as well. Um, Nick, ongoing services. Oh, actually I have something to talk about first. So um, ongoing services for international students. So we have on the International Student and Scholar Services website a um, pretty robust COVID-19 FAQs. Our campus also has a large website dedicated to COVID-19 information, but this is specific for that international student and scholar audience with a lot of immigration information. Um, you know, since we had our orientations, the SEVP and ICE announcement came out, which of course caused a lot of chaos, but then um, luckily that was rescinded. But we did do some Zoom Q and A's for students, especially F1 students who had questions about how that would impact them. And I think that was really helpful to um, making them feel like their questions were being heard. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Nick. Absolutely, Marta. It's actually been um, just a maybe four hours since the last time someone asked me, when is that Zoom Q&A session? I need to be there. I need to get in on that. Uh, we're also doing virtual check-in. So as an ongoing service, uh, normally we would have talked about our in-person check-in, where to go, what to bring, what will happen there. And so we're doing that virtually uh, in a contactless, you know, non-present way, collecting immigration information, but also providing a really robust resource fair opportunity to get them more uh, information and opportunities to kind of have almost like an office hours or a resource fair type situation with campus partners. It doesn't stop there. Um, we go into orientations and stuff. Florence, could you tell us more about orientations and all the rest? Absolutely. So we're so disappointed that we won't be able to welcome our students in person. This experience allowed us to go through our best practices um, moving forward. So with pre-recorded um, presentations along with live Q&A, because as we mentioned, the questions are so important, we will be hosting our virtual undergrad and graduate orientations um, via Zoom as well. We also have a whole host of workshops. Um, we know that um, communities, institutions are um, thinking through uh, professional development differently, having conversations differently. So uh, being able to provide intercultural workshops, opportunities for growth moving forward, um, along with um, social networking and to kind of undergird our co-curricular learning has been quite exciting. Um, some interesting programs that we just finished um, coming out of um, our office um, is Never Have I Ever. We did a virtual movie um, and after party conversation where we talked about um, um, questions and concerns around assimilation, culture, um, uh, marriage, race, um, and ethnicity, um, along with our museum tour Tuesdays, which has been amazing um, to have this kind of virtual experience for not only our students, but our de um, dependents, their children, and their families to also engage with us during this time and to network um, with us um, during this um, time of pandemics. Um, we also have um, lots of activities. Nick, you want to talk more about some other programming that we have? Absolutely. Uh, we, let me get off the mute here. Absolutely. We have a lot of other programs, um, workshops, and other experiences we're doing throughout the fall and the spring. Uh, I want to actually cut it there and just skip to this. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your service to our incoming international students and their families, dependents. Um, thank you for your service to the field um, and, and being here with us today. We encourage you to contact us. Those are real email addresses, so you can you can reach us. If you got questions in an hour or a month or a year, uh, please keep the conversation going. And for now, um, I want to ask what questions do you have for us? Unless Kate says I can't ask questions, you have questions now. <laughs> no, you can. Okay. Yeah. We're having a good conversation in the chat about getting reports and usage reports there, so that's good. And I don't have my 
participant thing. So if anyone's raising their hand or anybody <laughs> wants to just jump in. This is Liz from uh, Michigan State University. Oh, hey, Liz. Hey, Liz. Hey, how's it going? So uh, good. Go Spartan. Okay. Yeah, it's awesome. Life is great. Um, I wanted to know a little bit more about what Florence was saying. I think she said, did you say, uh, Florence, that you're doing weekly museum visits? Yes, yeah, so every Tuesday we like to showcase a museum tour um, for our students to engage in conversations, um, think about archiving. We just finished um, um, doing a tour of the Smithsonian virtually, which was so fun um, um, that students, their families and children could participate in. And we hosted it every um, Tuesday um, so that um, as part of our marketing protocol that every Tuesday someone knew that this is what we were doing and that we were featuring new um, museum experience. And I'm, I'm so sorry. That is absolutely true if we make the small change. First Tuesday of the month. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <First> Tuesday of the month. <laughs> Liz, I think maybe part of the origin of your question might be, uh, you're doing this every week? Um, <laughs> but yeah, Florence, you've been in those. Are those, those are, those are going well, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and um, students especially have um, this about feeling lonely um, during this time. So it's an opportunity for them to network, build rapport, um, have conversations um, around something that they like and ultimately telling us that they didn't even know that they could do this. So we're absolutely glad that we can offer something that um, people wouldn't think that they would have access to otherwise. Whereas from there, um, students were talking about, well, um, can I go to Disneyland virtually? And we're like, well, yeah, let's look into research um, and how we can make that experience happen. So that's been a fun experience um, as well. Florence, my question. So you include current students too, right? Um, this, the audience is really current students, not paid accepted, or you include both? Um, it's a mixture of both. Um, I'm thinking about never have in particular, but it is a mixture of both. Interesting. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, and something I should have said before, we are planning to do virtual uh, every chance we get uh, from now on. We absolutely love, not least because we can be much more inclusive of our entire student population, over 100 countries around the world. It's not just about China, India, Korea, you know. Um, question about academic advising and registration, where does it fit in? Um, I'll be honest, uh, if you hang out with Illinois for more than five minutes, you'll hear Illinois is a very decentralized campus. And so we'll say that um, academic advising and registration happens um, typically um, at, at other levels um, and in other locales or situations. I know some schools actually have registration and advising as part of their PDO. Um, we have not, and we've chosen not to, to try to streamline our travel and um, uh, also because the campus is handling that in different ways around different parts of the campus. So um, I will, add, can I add something to that, mm -hmm. Nick, really yeah. quick? I will say that um, in the undergraduate academic breakout, they do talk very broad brushstrokes about what academic advising looks like, some of the expectations, um, and a bit about the registration process. When the timing of when we travel, um, a registration has often already taken place. Um, so it's information that's sort of useful for the future, um, but the academic advising does get covered by whomever from the colleges, one of the colleges is representing um, academics for undergraduate students. Well, I thank you for your um, questions, comments, answers. Richard, um, have a great day. Appreciate you. Um, we might turn it back over to Kate yes. and the Wolverines out yes. over there at the big house. All right. We'll see y'all soon. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, UIUC team. And thank you, Megan from the Ohio State University. Um, I will let the, um, if you really know I get out the uh, presentation, I will share my uh, PowerPoint. Um, you hear my presentation has a lot of similarities. Um, so I will make sure not wasting your time. Um, and I may go quickly with the similarity um, and then just to touch on um, the one that's quite different. Okay, I think everybody can see my slides. Thumbs up. 
Okay, good. All right. So before this, let me go back a little bit. So last year, for the first time, University of Michigan conducted pre-departure orientation for the first time. Um, and before we did that, and then I know Megan from Ohio State and Liz Matthew from Michigan State, gosh, I don't know how many emails I sent it to you. How many times can we get on the phone and talk to us? Um, that was really helpful reaching out to colleagues and universities who have done this with so much experience. We learned so much so we know we don't make the same mistake. Uh, so that was extremely helpful. So last year, we only went to China. We only went to Beijing and Shanghai. Um, and then we met with students and parents in the session. We put them all together. Uh, the first one, we did it in Beijing. Uh, the second city, we went to Shanghai. So for the first session, we, we, there's three staff. So my office, International Center, we're under students' life. We're the only office travel. There's three of us. I have three colleagues who are also joining today's presentation. We're all on the same team. There's a Jake and then Kelly Wagner, Kelly Nelson. So Kelly Wagner is my partner in crime for this, for sure. We too planned everything logistically. We had some support in China last year because a couple of former Chinese students, um, alumni, they funded the whole everything. So they help us with the hotel, which was extremely helpful with all the logistics. Unlike uh, uh, Ohio State, they have gateway offices in China. University of Michigan doesn't have anything. Um, so when you think about logistics, if you want to print anything and then where do you put them? You have t-shirt. Are you able to put them in a suitcase and travel? So those are logistic questions to keep in mind. So we went last year, three people, myself and Kelly Wagner and also our director, Dr. Judy Penn as well. So last year we went only two cities and then in, in Beijing, in Shanghai as well, we recruited some Chinese students to uh, talk, you know, share their experience in, on the panel as well. When we selected them in Ann Arbor, we told everybody, everybody presenting in Chinese. So they, are, they were all prepared. But 10 minutes into the presentation in Beijing and parents in the room and say, mm, I think they need to speak Chinese. We don't understand really what they're talking about. So we have to tell students volunteers and, and then change the language right away. Some find it very challenging because they studied so many years in the United States. And when you switch that, and sometimes they're like, oh, how is this being translated into Chinese? So that's one thing we learned for sure. This year, we were planning to go to uh, Indian, two cities, China, three cities, Taiwan, and South Korean. Um, this was partially funded from the International Students Fee um, and still organized by my office, International Center. We had two teams. Uh, one team traveled to India, another team traveled to China, Taiwan, and South Korea. Kelly Wagner and myself, we did all the logistics in terms of funding hotels, uh, you know, you name it, snacks and room set up and everything. We spent hours and hours. And then because the time difference, when hotel respond, you know, it's, it's a different time. So we have to make sure we respond right away while you know they're working there in the office. This year we were, um, planning to have a four hour long event. One hour is designated for registration and social interactions, three hour presentation uh, with a short break in between. And we learned from last year, we decided to divide students and family into two groups. So for the students group, they will be um, conducted in English, for the parents will be conducted in native languages. We, we recruited some students volunteers who speak the local language as well. Topics will be a wide range from weather, packing, housing, dining, immigration, you know, safety, and pretty much everything that new students need to know prior to arriving on campus. Of course, with COVID, we have to cancel everything, even including some of the hotel, we made reservations. So it's a lot of work you can imagine. With constant changes of immigration regulations and our office as an FAQ for newly admitted international students, we also updated our international students welcome booklet. We also use newsletters to communicate with new students. Uh, sometimes we do twice a month and sometimes maybe once a month. In May and early June, we were sort of in the wait and see mode because we didn't know, we didn't know what's gonna happen in fall. What university will make any announcement? What does that look like? So typically we would reach out to new students in May. So this year was a little bit later. 
summer orientation, typically without COVID, we would do a three week long orientation with over 25 different workshop topics for new students. Each week workshop topic will be repeated. So students can arrive at any time of the week and then we'll be able to catch up with the workshop that they missed the previous week. Um, with this year, we can't do anything in person. So we piloted Ask Me session led by one staff and one or two summer orientation peer advisors. It's really meant to be an opportunity for new students to submit their questions when they register. So we will be able to design our PowerPoint and open up in Q&A, specifically addressing their questions and concerns. We are also expecting our summer peer advisor this summer to do blog and videos. Um, so they will be able to document their personal stories and share useful tips as well. We have to put all workshop presentations, uh, slides into Canvas. We created a course in Canvas. We're planning to use the discussion and chat function that we have our utilized our peer advisors to uh, lead the conversation discussion, live chat with students who may have some general questions. We also will have 15 peer to peer conversation um, sessions, virtual sessions on 15 different topics. So peer advisor will be leading this might be potentially on banking, housing, setting up utilities, or even how to navigate through Canvas or getting involved, um, learning all kinds of things that new students find it very beneficial. So we will start doing that uh, in early August. Now virtual pre-departure orientations, we offered four sessions. This year, we also use the Zoom um, for some, we use meetings as well as webinars when we learn there are a lot of you know, students coming. With a Zoom meeting, you can only hold, I think, 300 people. With webinars, you can have more than 500 people. So we decided to use both um, tools. We promoted our virtual pre-departure session through our newsletters. We also work with Chinese students, Taiwanese students uh, closely as well, helping us with the promotion. We held regular meetings with staff and students who are involved with doing the pre-departure orientation presentation. We also did a debrief right after each session. This year, we condensed everything into 90 minutes a session um, and cover campus life, uh, immigration, orientation, and beyond. We had one session specifically for new Taiwanese students presented by two staff and one student from Taiwan and two additional staff managed the chat. Uh, as everybody else already mentioned, we have so many questions came through chat. The China session also presented by two staff members, one Chinese student, two additional staff members managing, managing chat questions. And then we had two additional sessions that opened to all new international students at all academic levels, presented by three staff members and two additional staff uh, managed the chat questions. All four PDO sessions are, uh, were recorded, and then we also made presentation and recording available on the website. Zoom, one feature is really nice, thinking about accessibility is as close to caption, so that's another reason we decided to use Zoom. Um, we did also do evaluation, so when towards the end of the presentation, we're making sure putting the evaluation link in chat, we also did a QR bar, so students will be able to scan and do that. I have to say the uh, return rate for the evaluations are very low, um, which, you know, a lot of things to think about it. How do you do that in the future? So there's a lot of things that we want to think about it and how do we prepare for the next, I guess, wave will be sometime between December and early uh, January before our winter semester starts on January 19th. So that is all the um, presentation that I had prepared. Um, I want to make sure any questions specifically for me. I don't see any questions for Michigan. Um, oh, that sounds Hi. like this, hi, everybody. This is Beth. I am sorry from University of Minnesota, but I had to move over to my phone. But I actually have a question for, um, for, for UK as well as others about the time zones differences. And, you know, it's a huge debate about um, how we make uh, the virtual environment accessible. What have you found as far as um, best response, best attendance and, and responses from students around 
when when things can can be done for them. I can respond for both China and Taiwan. It, we did it in the early morning, uh, nine o'clock, uh, knowing the time difference. The other two additional session, we did one, I think 9.30, another one in the afternoon around 3.30ish. Yeah, Penn State is kind of similar. We do uh, early morning, eight to 10.30, Saturday morning. Uh, that So it is Saturday evening for China time. Um, students don't worry about have to stay up late or parents too, so. We did, um, at Illinois, we did primarily in the morning and students seem to, to be fine with that in terms of uh, the, the regions of attendance. Um, our, our Europe, Africa zone was actually the most well attended. Um, and surprisingly, our Middle East South Asia session, which include India, the country we had planned to go to for the first time this year, was our worst attended session. Um, I think of not even 50%, I think we had a 48% turnout or something like that. So surprisingly low considering um, such a high number of registrations in an area we were hoping to serve. So that was interesting to us. Oh, and, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nick. Uh, it would be really quick. And Marta, can you confirm, we weren't saying, where are you in the world? Where will you be joining? And then sending them a link. We gave them options of which to choose. And maybe people were choosing different times on their own. Is that something that, that was happening, right? It, it did happen, but it was very limited. Okay. Um, just mostly um, for the Middle East, South Asia, and the East Asia Pacific, there were a few students that... Um, those differently, but it was very limited. Thank you. Then, I mean, it's a basic question, but it's very helpful to, to hear. And then we, we did ours at Ohio State. We did it at 9 a.m. U.S. time, uh, 9 p.m. for students. And then the parent version, we did it 10 p.m. on a Friday night U.S. time, which would be 10 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday morning. So, so families that had jobs would be able to attend on the weekend. One thing I did forgot to mention, for a total of four sessions, we had over 680 um, individuals attended. Uh, I think the one for China reached the capacity 300 uh, Zoom meetings, so that's why we decided to uh, move to a different one to webinar. Yeah, for China, we also this year virtually pretty much uh, all paid accepted students have attended because total about 600 some registered. Um, some could not join and uh, register, but could not join due to technology issue or other stuff. But um, yeah, majority did come for our two virtual one. And throughout summer, we've been hosting all virtual orientation, kind of the old NSO, ISO. <laughs> uh, it's all virtual and we've been having so many sessions we always try to do in the morning because that's the best time working for our international students from India, from uh, Malaysia and China, Korea. So morning would be your option probably. Uh, looks like Morgan had a question. Um, maybe not necessary for University of Mich um, Michigan. Um, for the in-person one we did last year from 10 to noon and then we had a break in an hour but we kept the parents in the room so we keep talking a little bit about more you know privacy law HIPAA, FERPA, those type of thing and then they join the students for snack and then come back from 1 uh, to 3 p.m so that's what's total four hours in person for university of michigan Yeah, we had four hours too uh, last year in person, but this year we really shortened because you don't want them staying, you know, in front of PC for four hours. So this year we have, yeah, shortened to two and a half hours. For Illinois, we don't require any orientations at any time. So we, um, for the most part, that's mostly true for almost every student, but uh, we strongly recommend them. We uh, we let people think it's mandatory sometimes. Um, but uh, the big difference in our content is that the in-person is often things that you 
um, won't need to know beforehand, but you will need to access once you're here. A lot of in-person is things like um, using the counseling center, uh, more in depth about uh, McKinley Health Center and some student insurance issues, student legal services, for instance. Uh, and so some of the content will be a little different, um, even if they are the same presentations. Immigration pre-arrival includes things like how to get to the US, what to expect at um, Customs and Border Protection, Port of Entry, things like that. Once they're here, we're thinking much more about maintained status, don't work without authorization, stuff like that. Um, and Nakia, if you are still around, I want to mention something about LAS 100 as one of the ways we do ongoing orientation in a virtual format at U of I. Well, hello. I wasn't Hi. expecting a um, <laughs> shout out, but hello, everyone. I'll speak briefly um, <laughs> to Nick's point here. My name is Nikia Brown. I'm the Associate Director for Intercultural and Global Learning International Student Experience at the University of Illinois. <laughs> and I'm also the course instructor for LAS 100, which is a transition course for degree seeking international students um, who, you know, are who are new to um, not only the United States, but also, um, I know long titles, right? <laughs> who are also new to this uh, academic culture. So the course provides them with some with some just um, some steps to get adjusted to the university, but we expand that also to learning about different American norms, social justice, what is global leadership, um, what's your personal responsibility in address in addressing social challenges. So we've since we have another orientation course, we've been able to expand kind of the different topics that we discuss with our international students and they are super engaged, they love it. Um, and at the end of each semester, they actually interview with a, a mentor um, that serves as a staff member for a particular campus unit. And they offer kind of a workshop to the other international students about this particular campus unit and how um, international students can take advantage of these resources and different support systems that that are here so that's a little bit about the course um and i'm and i'm i'm new so this fall semester is going to be my first time teaching it and teaching in an online format so very excited about that so thank you nick for the shout out um in the interest of time so i want to ask nick um there are 21 people are still here. Um, so I don't know, do you still want to do the breakout room? So you want to do it in one or how do we want to proceed? Uh, I would, I would absolutely. <laughs> Liz is already talking about, let's do it together. Liz, is that your answer to Kate's question? Do it together? Together? Sure. Yeah, that was my answer. Together. I just want to hear what people are right. asking and I've what got, people yeah. are doing. Yep. I've got private messages and public messages saying together. <laughs> All right. And there are questions we haven't addressed. I saw yeah. Morgan also mm -hmm. asked, I would also be curious to hear what your institutions are doing this fall in a way of extended orientation, transitional programming for international students via virtual platforms. Yeah, um, Penn State, we are having, um, well, because a big percentage of students are in Shanghai or so, so that's about 600 students there. So we are going to have residential programs in Asia for those two campuses. We work with our partner universities. We don't really have a campus there, but uh, uh, we will do a lot of residential programs and also bi-weekly virtual programs with um, Penn State. So kind of like over summertime, we've been having weekly global hangouts with, with the theme each week. So we'll be bi-weekly. We call We Are uh, Global Engagement. So students, no matter where they are, could be studying from home in India, Saudi Arabia, or uh, residential study in Shanghai or so, they can connect with us uh, virtually. So that's one way we're gonna connect with them. I'll chime in with some of the ones that we're doing. We're doing our um, monthly film series. We also do a speed friending event every week for students. And so that's for new students and for um, current students. And then we'll have, we'll still have three weeks of programming like we typically would, but our programming will all go online. Um, so we won't be able to do any in-person thing just due to, you know, PPE needs and budget. Um, but we're doing, 
academic workshops in those three weeks leading up to the start of school. Um, also, our student health center will do a specific workshop. We still have our resource fair that will be online. Um, so there's a number of things that we've just transitioned to being in an online setting. Uh, but I don't think that we're necessarily sacrificing our services, but it does lose some of the engagement pieces uh, that direct one on one in person type of setting. But we've gotten a lot of students who are really enjoying speed friending and we also do virtual game nights and stuff like that with students. Megan, could you say more about what speed friending is and how you're doing it, especially in yeah. the school? Um, so we do it with, uh, we just use Zoom. And so there'll be funny things like um, like a treasure hunt, if you will, for things that are just sitting around your apartment. And then whoever gets back first is kind of a little show and tell like. Um, and so like you'll have to randomly find like something that you would drain noodles with. Um, and so you'll, you know, all those kind of funny things. Uh, but students have been pretty active. We haven't, we've done it in small groups so you can go into breakout rooms for a little bit more intimate conversation. Uh, and we don't record that part of it um, for any of our sessions. So that even with the questions and answers um, in small Zoom breakout rooms, we have agreed that we wouldn't do any sort of recordings of that conversation. So students could feel like they're able to have actual conversations. Anything with a real presentation we're recording, but um, yeah, the speed funding has been really fun for students. They've enjoyed participating and the numbers are picking back up now that school's starting to start again. But, yeah. I, I just noticed um, Ke Hui is here and I don't mean to put you on the spot and Ke Hui is a PhD student from China. She is one of our summer orientation peer advisors. So we're just so happy she's here and joining us. Um, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? I said a lot of things about you. Yeah, of course. It's so good to see everyone. Uh, I just joined the uh, University of Michigan peer advisor team. Um, and uh, it's my very first time facilitating new in, uh, international student orientation. So it's so good to hear um, different uh, like peer um, and different university how they organize um, the PDO. Uh, and I'm also a Penn Stater. <laughs> so uh, when I was watching uh, Anna's presentation, it just brought me brought get back so much wonderful um, memories. Um, so good to meet everyone and I learned so much today. Kobe was also one of the um, International Center Students uh, Council lead. Um, so she was great and we're just so glad she's on board. University of Michigan for fall, in terms of programming, everything will be virtual. Um, you know, we have been doing that and everything will be virtual from, you know, maybe monthly coffee hour, monthly birthday celebration, no real cake, but we can still do virtually. Um, we do monthly international students uh, lunch conversation with our counseling psychological services. We have been offering it throughout summer as well. In the summer, we also added a once a month integration update and Q&A. Gosh, easily get 500 people instantly. That's the hot topic, uh, popular program. So we will just move virtually. Um, in terms of the, the chat, some questions coming in. Kay, do you mind if I ask a couple questions? No, go ahead. Okay, uh, I just wanted to uh, point to Liz and um, Rick Lee's questions. Um, I think maybe Megan had mentioned game nights. What games do you play? How do you organize those, particularly virtual? Um, and also logistics for film screenings. That's been a big thing for us. Uh, Florence has figured out some things and we're looking at other things, but it's, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing from Megan uh, and maybe Florence as well or anybody else. So Megan, games and film screenings? Yeah, there's actually, um... My colleague, Dan Montour, uh, if you're interested in doing the, yeah, he's great. Uh, if you're interested in doing the games, I would say reach out to him. He's done some of the ones like, I think one's called Werewolf. Um, he's done um, like a version of a Pictionary, uh, different things like that, but students have really enjoyed it. Um, and of course, like we have advertised it as you don't have to know the game in order to participate. So there is the instruction portion of it. So you just have to show up and we walk students through. Um, so everyone's kind of on that same page and you don't have to feel intimidated or anything like that. Um, so yes, Dan Montour is the person that you wanna to talk to for that one. Um, as far as watch parties, we've actually used um, 
a our university libraries has um, starts with like a K, not Canvas, Carbon, Canva, something. Oh, uh, what? Cultura? No, but whatever your university uses for your video sharing service, we've sent that out as well. So we um, students have been able to do it that way. We've also tried doing um, a live stream uh, where we actually like purchased the movie or we had it on Netflix, uh, but the bandwidth for a lot of people, it just wasn't working well. Um, and then we also created um, a group uh, that was uh, on GroupMe. So then anyone that wanted to watch, we tried it a couple different ways where you, we would watch it all at once at the exact same time and then see if students wanted to chat um, throughout the movie. There wasn't as much engagement. So we did it where we told them what the movie was and then we would have the, the discussion portion at a scheduled time. Um, so We've tried it a couple different ways, but Donya Contractor in our office, she we typically do a monthly film series with our film center on campus. Um, but since we haven't been able to been in, be in person, this was our kind of alternative arrangement to that. Um, but we've tried to use resources that were free and accessible for students, no matter where you were. Um, one thing I want to add for Harrisburg campus, Penn State Harrisburg, we have a global ambassadors program. We're very intentional to select global ambassadors from around the world. So um, we are planning right now for fall 2020 festival celebrations. We will have virtual Eid celebration September, Moon Festival October, Diwali late October, and then Halloween and Thanksgiving, either beginning of November in the middle of November. So that way we have five festival celebrations virtually and we want to engage our students from, for example, for Eid will be from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Indonesia, Malaysia. You know, those students love to share how they celebrate. And we had a great success in summertime, one uh, Eid event. So students from Saudi and Kuwait and American students, Saudi, you know, so they would show us the decoration in their home. It was just amazing. When you, you know, you feel, and the food, they, they show us in the kitchen, the whole family there. Um, um, just great uh, way, you know, we, we never could do that, right? Before when we do a festival celebration, it's a huge room, just us, dance and performances and food. But now we don't, we don't have food, but we have this, you know, beautiful view from different countries. So we want to be intentional continuing this um, celebration to engage our students. Thank you so much for that, Anna. Um, and thinking about also celebrating our international students and community, we've also been hosting our kind of intercultural spotlights where we um, think through um, and hosting specific people and our, our scholar staff, um, um, professor community um, to a specific country. So we just finished Iran, Korea. Um, I'm forgetting the third one. Why am I forgetting the third one? Help me, Nick. <laughs> oh, it's a... Uh uh brazil brazil oh yes sorry it took and me it a moment too <laughs> um and, and and it was so wonderful because they were able to share familial um kinship practices marriage practices food and culture a little bit of what brought them um to the university of illinois urbana champagne community um and it just brought out different people and asking different questions so that has been really fun as well um we've been also hosting um trivia night for our um, staff who also work with international students and I think that will also be a great idea to extend to students as well and that has been great and fun as well um, and Nick do you want to talk about wake up with IS oh I was definitely gonna cut that for the interest of time but totally I I'm happy to talk about myself um, yeah so we were um, you know obviously uh, the idea of a coffee hour town hall open kind of thing everything is about social right now, not social media. I mean, just people saying, Hey, it's all about social um, connection, whatever else we're doing. We're trying to keep a social connection um, aspect to it for sure. As well as some things that are just about dropping in, checking in, hanging out. So I've been hosting kind of an open office hour slash thing it was initially called, it's called wake up with IS. Uh, really, really great idea. Um, I wanted to have it at, on Mondays at 9am we're going to get the week started we're going to get we're going to encourage each other to like stay productive even though we don't have the accountability of offices etc and uh i found out that's too early for a program um which is the whole point of it 
but uh, we'll, we'll try that again in some other format later. I've got a really solid couple of folks though that I'm actually, it's kind of like an accountability group for me uh, and them. So we're doing some good stuff around uh, self-care and, and, and motivation and stuff with a few international students. But um, yeah, we, you know, Netflix watch parties, a really, really great platform. Um, sucks that you got to have a, a subscription. So um, that makes it less accessible. I'm seeing discord as a way. Um, I haven't been using discord uh, professionally. I wonder if other people have good experience with that. That's what we used for the last night's film series. So I just wanted to put that out there that that's another option if you don't have Canopy. And are, are students already, I mean, I, I feel like students are already pretty familiar with Discord. Um, is, that, is that an easy thing that they're just already kind of plugged into? Are you having to do any kind of education around like, here's how to use it, here's how to get up with it? Is it, um, yeah, I'm just curious. Are, is, you're not using like any kind of, it's like a work account or a, a dedicated account for that. How are you thinking about Discord? Um, I don't have a, an account for it. Um, Danya has walked students through, but it hasn't seemed like it was really difficult for students to access. It was just another route that students were able to go to watch a film. I'll uh, put her contact information and Dan's in the chat if anyone's interested. Cool. As always, we're thinking about regional restrictions. Have you heard of any regional restrictions with that? No one has brought it up so okay. far. Cool. Um, my colleague Kelly Wagner is still here. Um, I hate to put her on the spot. I was just wondering if she's our program manager. She has done an amazing job leading our International Students Council as well as doing a lot of program around diversity, equity, inclusion. I don't know whether you, you mind to just to say a few words what you have in mind thinking about fall. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think we're gonna keep everything like Kate mentioned virtual for the fall. Um, we piloted doing our lunch and learn conversation already. Um, we did a conversation about the Black Lives Matter movement um, just to sort of A, test out how lunch and learns might look because usually they're around social justice topics. So how do you keep them conversational um, in a virtual setting and still build connection? Um, but I think it went pretty well. We had 20-ish students, I think, attend. Um, and so we'll continue to do those in the fall. We have one's already scheduled around the election and what does it mean, um, especially because previously we were supposed to hold the debate in October, although U of M's not doing that anymore. Um, and then for the International Center Student Council, um, we are going to keep it virtual this year um, because of budget and just logistics. I don't think we'll be hiring co-leaders again. Um, I have a graduate and undergraduate student leader, but we'll still keep a group of around 10 or so students. Um, to be on the council and meet monthly and just talk about pretty much this year, how's it going? What can we do better virtually? Um, do you have any thoughts about campus climate and that sort of thing? So um, yeah, hopefully it still works out virtually, we'll see. Um, still a little nervous about the connection piece and like building relationships that way, but hopefully, at least with like ICSC, since they're meeting every month, we can be a little more intentional about building in like icebreakers and things like that to help the students. So get to like know each other pretty well. Great. Great. I thought I heard somebody talking. Morgan, there's a great question in the chat from you. I'm gonna say something about that. Um, in, a, in a little bit, I'll actually be going, popping into a meeting where we're talking to our our remote starts are, we're calling them academic bridge programs where students are starting their um, first year at the University of Illinois from campuses uh, abroad um, and then gonna be transferring hopefully as soon as the spring. Um, so uh, for people who are abroad and basically we're, we're thinking especially in terms of um, active and see this as the, I'm just gonna keep it 100% honest here. Uh, one question we have is funding. And, and who we're serving based on, on funding needs and things like that. And so um, we're thinking of students that are active and see this, if they're, if they're active and online, that's cool. We're serving them um, full service. For folks who are abroad, there's, there's a question. We'll be doing some things with them. Um, so we'll be uh, certainly inviting them to some of our, uh, like our orientation. Some of our orientation sessions will make sense 
for those starting at say Zhejiang University. Um, other things won't make sense, so we won't be including them there. And then um, I've been just kind of making a practice when we're in pre-arrival orientations or when other spaces um, with students who may or may not be coming, I'm advertising anyway um, to try to invite them to some stuff um, to get them connected, start building friendships. I know that one of our partner programs, we work with the Office of Inclusion and Intercultural Relations here on something called the GLOBE program. And I won't try to explain or even defend the acronym, but it's a uh, peer mentoring a uh, group of international students, group of domestic or experienced, you know, on-campus students here. Some of that's going to be going on um, with some of the friendship uh, and group formation happening during the fall semester with online students and hopefully doing first in-person meetings uh, by spring or following. Uh, totally curious about what other people are doing, though. Um, is that a, you know, if you're going to be doing the full service, full experience with those folks or what are you doing with the students overseas? That's a good question. I think different time zone, it's a huge challenge. Um, and right now we're just thinking broadly, anything we're planning for fall, we'll welcome anybody to join. But if you're doing lunch here, lunch, and that's midnight in China, it doesn't make any sense for them. So I, I don't think I have the answer. Um, I think that's everybody's struggling with, what do you do with students who are going to be remote? Yeah, we'll try to stay in the morning just because most mornings are still workable, you know, before noon. Um, and then secondly, for our culture events, we try to have five different times, just auto alternating. So uh, for example, for Eid, we want to consider mainly for Middle Eastern and South Asian students because they celebrate. We want them to be able to engage, engage them with real time kind of celebration. And then for Moon Festival, we, you know, want to be consideration for China and Korean students. Students. And for Diwali, of course, uh, India and um, Sri Lanka. And, and then for Halloween and Thanksgiving will be US time, but again, hopefully applicable to most of our students overseas. Um, but we do have one common hour. We still want to finalize that common hour, meaning anybody can join in, you know, by weekly. Um, we'll focus on Penn State Pride. Uh, fun information or diversity and just more like a Penn State identity kind of thing for them. So yeah, so we're still programming. Hopefully by next week or two, we'll have more ideas and finalize them kind of, yeah. I'm curious, I have a question and I see a, a small lull and a small gap here. So I'm gonna ask, um, did anything about what, I'm kind of asking out to the, the um, rest of the group. Uh, ooh, Beth's jumping in. Yes. Um, I'm asking the rest of y'all, anything, did anything resonate about what we're doing that you're saying, yes, that sounded like motivating and energizing. I want to do that thing. We're doing that thing. Or was there anything that you saw us talking about where you thought, oh boy, why are we doing it that way? That sounds like number one, I don't want to do it that way. Or any pushback or, or, or commentary or things that we'd say like, hey, we tried that. It's not really working for us. I'm curious, like, um, how did some of these pre-departure things land with you? Um, what are you planning to do? Um, you planning to do one in October for those spring starts? Um, are you planning to do one next May, next June, uh, July? You know, no matter what, what, what are people thinking? How is it gonna look for you? I don't know, this is Beth. I did unmute it, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so a, a couple of things I, I wanna say that, um, Something that resonated and I thought was, you know, just something spectacular that is coming out of this is the fact that, you know, in this virtual culture that we can basically have the ability for people from around the world show us the world in which they're living. And I, so I kind of feel like there is this opportunity that perhaps we haven't seen before where um, you could have it where students physically pick up their phone and kind of do the tours of their lives and, and how that might impact um, how we, we view uh, the people we're in relationship with. And so I think there's a huge opportunity there. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to see how, where that could go. Um, and I think this, this question about um, previous to the question you just asked Nick, which was, um, what are people doing for the students who are online? And uh, I think that is a 
is an institutional question because uh, we have people online all over within the U.S., outside of the U.S., um, and so how do we as an institution build this community? Um, and so right now we're in discussions with our um, Office of Undergraduate Education about, you know, on a broader scale, what, how do we create community virtually for so many people and how can we bring international students um, into that and you know this idea of they, they could bring some pretty stellar stuff to those conversations if we create an intentional structure in which um, they're bringing in who they are in the world that they're living in so I, I think it could be exciting but as you know uh, for us all there's a lot of planning that takes place to make these things work Are there any other questions that we haven't addressed? Mm. Uh, yeah, actually, I do have a question. Uh, this is Morgan uh, from UW Madison, who has been writing so many questions in the chat, and I haven't actually spoken <laughs> used my voice yet. So, um, I guess my silent voice. But uh, yeah, I do have a question. I'd like to hear what people uh, are doing. Um, <clears throat> one aspect of orientation that I think some of you have touched on is uh, that term cultural adjustment. Um, and I would like to hear um, on that topic, um, what, you know, are you going, are you touching on that in pre-arrival? Are you touching on that day of orientation, like your quote unquote in-person orientation? Um, and what kind of content are you covering when you talk about cultural adjustment? Um, and then are you doing anything beyond orientation? Um, because I think there's a lot of different schools of thought about when you should be introducing that type of um, kind of theory-informed um, information that is extremely relevant to uh, an international student's experience uh, in the U.S. Um, for Penn State, um, we do American culture adjustment through either presentation residential one or this year virtual, we engage our alumni to share their experience, how they adjusted quickly. Um, so um, yeah, and then not just one time because that session only 25 minutes. We also have a building canvas course for them. I happen to be leading that particular session. Uh, I have actually two sessions. One is uh, academic culture, Penn State academic culture, and the other one is academic integrity. So I created um, kind of curriculum and bullets and stuff and then talk about it with uh, stories uh, from my teaching and my uh, you know, my, you know, just uh, experience of watching the adjustments. This is going to be not just a one time topic, it will be keep kind of reinforcing. So, uh, so the Canvas course after the session, the module, they have to have a test. <laughs> we have like a few just uh, building right a quiz kind of question. And um, yeah, so mainly, you know, besides pre pre-departure session. We also have Canvas sessions. And then once they are studying in the fall semester, we work with our learning center. Uh, we have first year seminar kind of um, course work, more like a session too. But they are required to join, um, you know, like how to cite um, properly and how to be an active learner. So we just kind of keep reinforcing uh, for new students. Um, at the University of Michigan, cultural adjustments is also uh, part of summer orientation. We actually have a workshop specifically talking about cultural adjustment roller coaster. Um, it's led by an a international students and scholar advisor, plus normally a couple of peer advisor who's joined talking about their experience. So this year with a virtual pre-departure orientation, um, we embedded some of the information into there as well. For example, I'll mention about utilizing campus career services. You know, that's something I think a lot of students only think about it the last semester I'm graduating. 
So this time at a virtual presentation, I made a point, you need to be proactive. If not the first semester, you need to probably the second semester once you're familiar with the campus environment, because this is really something you need preparation. It's not the last semester you're graduating. Um, so we embedded that conversation into there as well. We normally do our um, cultural adjustment during pre-departure orientation, but then another session for all students whenever we would normally be on campus. This time, um, we uh, it's one of the sessions that is what I present. Um, we will do it in a workshop setting, so there's still the opportunity for some engagement in there um, versus an online module in our um, Carmen Canvas course that we do for students. Uh, we do talk a little bit about, um, you know, that, you know, whether you go with the roller coaster or the W curve or, you know, whatever version of that you want to do. We talk about that a little, but I actually, I put it into context of, um, you know, we, we do use the iceberg and talk about the idea that you could use an onion with culture having many layers. Uh, but then I put it into, uh, once we have a good understanding of, you know, what is culture, what are aspects of culture, I talk about my experience traveling to another country and some of the things that were challenging for me. So you'll go through the period of like, you will find things that are familiar to you, but you will find things that you probably need a cultural liaison or cultural interpreter to help you out. And how do you actually build the relationships that will help you feel comfortable with someone where you can ask those questions that might feel like silly questions or maybe you're a little embarrassed to ask about um, and then going through like some of the stereotypes that you may have of the United States and why do you have those stereotypes but also um, that you know Americans are going to have a lot of stereotypes or generalizations about you and maybe where you come from and how do you um, navigate that um, so we've we are we're doing that for the first time as a, a workshop on its own versus just an hour-long presentation and a whole day-long session. I will say my personal experience, like without fail, I talk about toilets in China um, and the first time I had that experience and without fail, at least at every graduation reception that we hold, students will come up to me and they're like, I remember you, the toilet story. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> like, so, I mean, I think also sharing that like other people go through this, it's normal to go through these experiences. You can't read and learn about everything. Um, so that has been very much our reinforcing message for students is that no matter who you are, where you are, you are gonna go through some sort of adjustment when you get to a new place, even if it's within your own country. So, Hello everyone, this is Beth again. Um, I would like to ask an additional question if we're ready to for one. I'm not hearing anything, so I think it's okay. Um, yes. So my question is, has anyone, you know, being in this virtual world is its own culture in itself? And so I wondered if anybody has tried to uh, do something around the virtual culture of Zoom and how, we, how to navigate that, both from perspective of assisting students as well as, well as um, working with our staff and faculty to help them bridge the, the virtual culture for our, with our students. Has anybody tried to do any work on that? Actually, yes. <laughs> um, um, we did not mention that in preparation of our orientations, we did host some virtual considerations to consider not only around language and acronyms, but also around, uh, or idioms, but also around using the virtual space, making sure that we aren't complementing people's backgrounds because we never know where they are. Um, um, also ensuring that we know and are giving space to allow students, faculty, and staff to turn off their camera, to keep their camera on, to utilize the chat, um, to, um, or to raise their hands, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we have hosted a lot of um, conversations around also mannerisms, um, considering that oftentimes we aren't able, like my camera's off right now, so you can't even see my face. But ultimately, um, an example of, um, intent versus impact, ensuring that 
um, we are giving grace and asking those questions and enunciating because how we sound on screen, we don't kind of have those in-person cues um, to kind of guide us. So really doing the extra work of asking those inquisitive questions, but also being respectful of people's space, time, bandwidth, et cetera. And we did that specifically for faculty and staff. As part of our um, intercultural learning or training operations um, in relationship to some of the workshops that we host, um, we have also um, did, done a lot of work to create ground rules and mutual respectful spaces. So um, it's okay, again, to reiterate, um, well, actually for this conversation, we do want your camera on, we do want to see your face. So situating that space from up front, um, how to utilize um, the chat. Um, this is not a space to ask questions. Um, this is a space where um, um, in breakout sessions that, you, that you're having, um, that, 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 that you're able to discuss in context, whatever it is that you need, and you can ask for help or raise your hand and we will come um, um, get you or provide more details. So um, the grounding of the space and grounding of the rules does not change. Um, anyone who does intercultural learning work knows or, or diversity, equity, and inclusion work knows how crucial that is, especially in the virtual setting. Um, we've also um, um, have provided an element of safety. So ensuring that we are um, sending out correct Zoom links, um, that even right down to the timing of those Zoom links so we don't get Zoom bombed, adding um, passwords to our meetings as well has also been something that we've had to think critically about moving forward as well. So we've done a lot of programming, a lot of candid conversation, and a lot of pre-preparation um, presentation work to ensure that people feel comfortable um, using the virtual space um, as a platform um, in this um, current time. I mean, like right, I mean, right down to lighting. Um, Yes, my, me and my colleague Henry have done um, quite a few sessions um, with our orientation presenters to ensure that um, um, our virtual experience um, is as close <laughs> as possible to the experience that you would get in person. It would be so nice, um, Florence, this is great. Um, I would really like to learn from you because I have done um, culture training to our faculty and staff, but more culture sensitive, you know, ability, but that's more like um, residential teaching and stuff. I haven't even done any virtual one and I do plan to do one because we have so many students now studying remotely uh, from China, Korea, and also around the world. So uh, this will be very helpful. So your experience there would be very helpful to me too. Thank you. Florence, I'm sorry that I cannot see you because I'm on the phone, but um, do, is it possible, would you be willing to share what you, you've done? Um, we've done something also, but I, I'm not 100% secure in what we've done because, you know, it was during the time of, you know, it was a lot of transition, so it would be great to kind of compare notes on, on what, how people are talking about it. Absolutely. Um, I can go ahead and send you my email address um, so we can be in for, um, conversation about that moving forward. And for students, we, we do netiquette kind of canvas module with them and just to, uh, yeah, we'll kind of keep reinforcing them too which is so important too for them. Um, I want to be mindful about time. It's 4.55, uh, which I didn't mention at the beginning. I know a lot of people left. I'm planning to put the presentation um, everybody presented on the website. So I send everybody an email so people know where to find it. Any other questions comments no well thank you all for sticking around and to see so many have, yes nick I'm so sorry i have I too sorry really selfishly florence beth i just emailed you both so because uh, i know beth you're on the phone so you won't have gotten sure message there, so just making sure thank you so much no problem and i i thought it might be helpful i don't know if this would be um but i thought we might send around um i'm gonna ask uh Marta to definitely she had to head out, but I'm gonna ask Marta to make sure to get that report out to folks. A lot of good um, 
information in there. We also had prepared uh, some breakout questions. Um, and since uh, we had, we kind of started through that, there's a few things just to think about and consider. So we'll probably put those out there as well with the presentations. Kate, if that's all right. I just wanted to, to let you know that. Yes. Uh, the, and all the email addresses you've been seeing floating around, please contact us and have the conversation. Um, we're looking forward to it. All right, I'm done. Go ahead, Kate. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say thank you all so much, you know, for my uh, panelist uh, um, presentation and everybody contributed to this conversation. Just so good to see everybody. Uh, let's get a com conversation going. I know there are a lot of challenges ahead of us, but together uh, we'll get through this. So thank you all so much today for coming. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thank Stay you. Well. It was fabulous. Thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you. So nice meeting you all. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.